Hello, and welcome to lecture on protein structure. So the reading is from chapter 12. Um, and so today we're going to talk about the basics, uh, meaning um, the building blocks of, of proteins, which are amino acids. We're talking about things like dihedrals and what sort of constraints they, they have. We're going to talk about the hierarchy of structure. What does it mean to, what do we say, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure? Uh, and then we're going to go into detail into, into different types of secondary, ter sec secondary tertiary structure. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about structure, experimental structural determination techniques and the protein data bank, which is the main repository of structural data. So um, <clears throat> you've probably, you should have already uh, been introduced to, to amino acids. Um, so this will be a bit of a review, but um, you sh should recall that, um, that, uh, that um, molecules can have chirality and the preferred chiral form of amino acids is the L form. So that means that if you have an alpha carbon and you're looking down the hydrogen, because every, every one of these alpha carbons are gonna have one hydrogen, you're gonna look down that bond towards the alpha carbon and you're going to see a carboxyl carbon. You're gonna see the side chain and you're gonna see the mid nitrogen, right? And so if you go clockwise, it spells corn, C-O-R-N, right? And so, so, so if, if this were the, the um, D form, then um, we would, th they would go backwards. It would go counterclockwise. So, <clears throat> This is what one of these these uh, pieces of structural information that you should have in your mind anytime that you're you're sketching a peptide, and it's gonna it's gonna help you to understand things like where secondary structure comes from. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the the each each uh, in a polypeptide, the amino acids uh, conventionally go from from N to C terminus. So they start with the amino nitrogen, and then uh, follows the the alpha carbon and see, try to make sure I, I don't do this wrong. So let's say the hydrogen is coming up at us. Um, so that would mean the the carboxyl carbon would be let's say here. And then the uh, side chain would be something like here. Oops, sorry, mistake. No. Carboxyl car uh, carbon, and this oxygen, and side chain would be like this. Sorry. Um. So, and yeah, that's gonna that that side chain is gonna be kind of going into the page. Where is that? H is out of the page. So the next, the next uh, amino acid will be an N, and then would have an alpha carbon that would have a side chain, and then there would be a carboxyl carbon, and it starts over again. So um, about these two bonds, we have. Um, dihedral angles, which have sp specific names. These are phi and psi, right? And so by a dihedral angle, I mean that if, if I'm looking down, down from N towards C alpha, I'm gonna see an angle formed by this C and this C, right? The, the two carboxyl carbons. So, so basically, like let's say, let's say I am this 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 eyeball is my eyeball, 
um, I would be looking at this at this uh, nitrogen, and I would see this near carboxyl, um, and then I would see I wouldn't see the alpha carbon. It's kind of hidden behind here, like this. Let's just say it's a C alpha, and then I would see somewhere off in distance, I would see that other distant carboxyl carbon, All right? And this angle uh, would be phi, okay? And likewise, um, the, the psi angle would be the one formed by the four atoms, N, C alpha, C, and N. Okay. So the, these 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 side chains, which so far I drew only as something called R, uh, are con um, canonically twenty in number, hmm. and they they can be roughly classified into these these physical chemical classes. So you have hmm. you can't see that, can you? Okay, it's a little bit better. And so, so you have these, uh, for example, these hydrophobic side chains. Um, things like uh, alanine, valine, isoleucine, leucine. Uh, this tryptophan actually is a bit controversial. Some authors uh, would call it a polar side chain because nothing is absolutely nonpolar. Everything has at least a little bit of polarity, and tryptophan has a little bit more than some of these others. So, so depending on what experiment, experimental data you use and where you set your cutoffs, this, this might actually be called a polar side chain. Anyway, um, so th then we have these uh, polar ones, serine, threonine, asparagine, glutamine. And then uh, we have charged. So aspartate and glutamate have a negative charge. And um, arginine and lysine have a positive charge. And histidine sometimes has a positive charge and sometimes it's neutral. It depends on the pH. Um, okay. And so, so it's, it's, it's important to have a general overview of what, what these side chains look like um, and to be able to think about them. For, and you know, in this course, mostly we're, we're going to be interested in comparing side chains. And thinking about uh, you know how the, how they're similar or dissimilar sterically and in terms of their solubility and charge, um, and something else we're interested in is how they can interact with each other, right? Because these are the sorts of things that are going to end up uh, generating a, a signal that we can that we can detect or predict bioinformatically. So, so for instance, um, when we talk about valine, let's first let's first make sure we understand what we're looking at here. This N, that's the mead nitrogen that we talked about earlier, and then this, I mean, say like in, in this convention, anything that's not labeled, but which is clearly an atom, is a carbon. So that, that's the alpha carbon, and then there's a carboxyl carbon over here. Uh, this is an OH that's going to be basically disappear once once it gets this amino acid becomes part of a polypeptide. So so you wouldn't see that in the polypeptide. Anyway, over here, um, the next uh, carbon on the chain on the side chain is called C beta, uh, and then and then from there from there it goes on through the Greek alpha, so uh, delta. Um, Gamma, delta, take, um, sorry, I forget the, forget the Greek alphabet. But anyway, it's, um, the, the, the numbering goes like that. It goes, follows the Greek alphabet. And so, so the important thing, point I want to make here is, is that, for, for instance, one thing you might want to look out for is that this one, this beta, val, valine, is, um, is beta branched. And that means that um, C beta, which is the closest carbon to the C alpha, is branched. So it means that it has chemical groups containing heavy atoms um, branching at that point, not just one, but two. 
And so that 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 actually restricts the flexibility of the backbone to some extent. And so 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 add, so side chains that are beta branched have some some similarities to other side chains that are also beta branched. So for for instance, isoleucine is also beta branched. So here's the beta carbon, and here are the two branches. Leucine is not beta branched. Here's the beta carbon. It just has this 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 uh, gamma carbon uh, following it. Um, so so there's a, you, you, despite the naming uh, in in uh, yeah despite the naming that there's actually more similarity in my opinion between valine and isoleucine in terms of protein uh, physics the, the, because because the sterics are so similar because they have a similar effect on the on the flexibility leucine and isoleucine do have the same mass uh, at each other and so then they're still some still similar anyway so this is this sort of thinking is what you need to be, be going through uh going through your mind when you look at when you look at these uh at these side chains um look look for example here at phenylalanine so this guy this this has a a phenyl group so it's, it's a six-membered carbon ring which one is most similar to that well i mean hopefully you're saying tyrosine it's, it's it's the same thing except it's got a hydroxyl here at the far end and then th these two would still have some similarity to tryptophan but not as much as they have to to each other uh, there is some structural similarity between uh or a lot of structural similarity between glutamine and glutamate right the charge makes a big difference uh but uh, other than that, maybe you can expect that for some situations they might be reasonably compatible with each other. Same thing with aspartate and um, and asparagine. Mm. And of course, uh, arginine versus lysine, those would be similar in the sense that they're both charged. Ah, and they're both kind of long, but but other than that, they're 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 not the same length, and they're there's a substantial difference in mass. Okay, so hopefully you can appreciate some of these differences. And so so I, I mentioned that we're, oops. So I said we we're going to talk about the structural hierarchy. So what do we mean by, by a primary structure? That just means the, the sequence, basically. So you have some some sequence, and there's a single letter code, by the way, for for sequence. Um, you can say for A is alanine, V is valine, I for isoleucine, L for leucine, uh, W for tryptophan. You know, not surprisingly, they started running out of out of letters because you know T gets it was already maybe already used up by tyrosine or or threonine or both. Um, and then and so on so so you know it could be a k r whatever um so so that 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 tells you something it actually tells you a lot in principle i could predict all the other uh levels of structure in practice it's not always easy uh secondary structure that uh you should have seen secondary structure to some extent in, before in your life um that that means things like you know knowing that you have an alpha helix uh knowing that you have a beta sheet uh to some extent you might even know how these are interacting with each other right you might say oh this beta sheet is interacting with this other beta sheet and they're an anti-parallel something like that but you're still you're still talking about level of secondary structure because it's not really 3d and then 3d that's when 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 yes when you do know how they're all the pieces of secondary structure are arranged with respect to each other and depending on what's sort our of resolution, you might even know every the position of every single atom, you know, down to an angstrom, or even a fraction of an angstrom. So, so, so in that case, we we might have something that look kind of like this. Uh, and then let's say prior to that, there was an alpha helix. You might even know how it's situated with respect to those beta sheets. Don't believe me too much with the alpha helix being above or below i'm not i'm not sure which way i would go in the case of this motif that you're looking at here but anyway the point is that you have that you, at this point you know the 
the how these set pieces of secondary structure arrange with each other. But we're still at the monomer level. When I say monomer, I mean that we have one continuous uh, polypeptide. All the amino acids are covalently bonded sequentially in a strand from N to C. Quaternary structure means that there is more than one chain and they're interacting with each other. Uh, for the most part, non-covalently, but there, there can also be things like, like uh, um, that sulfide bridges. But anyway, the, the point is that um, we have, let's say, let's say the same strand as, as, as above, um, something like that. See? And then we might have some different protein over here. That's sort of interacting with it in some way. Sorry, my drawing is so crappy. Something like that. So that, let's say this is chain A and this is chain B, right? Okay, and there, there, and there are all sorts sorts of bioinformatical levels that 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 it, that it intended to to take as input any of these uh, levels of structure and produces as output any of these levels of structure. Okay. I'm blocking part of this uh, part of this matrix again, but don't worry about it. The, the, this square on the lower right is just empty. Uh, but my point is that is that um, uh, that there is a relationship between phi and psi. So psi is this axis up here, and phi is this, this axis here. So so um, the, these angles are not free to do just whatever they want. Um, there, there are certain preferred combinations of phi and psi and one of them makes this this uh the alpha helix and one of them makes the beta strand right and then there are disallowed regions like like for example all, everything that's white is basically disallowed and so disallowed is a it's not uh absolutely disallowed it just means that that if you're in that region you're unstable and you want to get out of it as soon as possible now, why would these regions be unstable? So I brought a little toy to to help uh, visualize this. And so, so what happens um, with the disallowed regions is that there there are certain angles of phi and psi that are just going to be bad news. For for instance, um, if you look at this, this is a um, the nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxyl carbon. And you'll have to blame Corona, but I ran out ran out of nitrogens. Those are all back at uh, Arrhenius. Um, anyway, just just imagine this purple is the same as this blue. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, it, this this is a, a phi because it's between N and the C alpha. So this is this is um, phi. So 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 you notice that there's a disallowed region of um, a phi, like like at, at zero. So zero is, zero is one of the places that are bad news. And um, so, so I've, I've put this in, in, in phi equals zero conformation. See, this is the atom one, two, three, and four. And these two guys are, are close to each other. So that's, that's cis, so that's, that's zero dihedral. Um, and uh, the, the, there's a planarity in this peptide bond. That's a partial hybrid bond. So, so that means that, um, that uh, Whatever's whatever's over here will always be in trans with whatever's over here. So so that, that this this alpha carbon is in trans with with this um, this alpha carbon, um, and um, so 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 that means that if you put this in zero, see that that right right here there's a clash with the following carboxyl oxygen, and actually you could get out of that a little bit if you if you um, if you rotate the psi angle, see this is a psi angle, but then you get you can get other clashes. So so in general, a phi equals zero is not a good place to be, right? So so you can see here, that's mostly disallowed. All the way down. Okay, and um, psi has kind of a similar issue, like th this is this is psi equals to zero, right? This is psi angle. Um, so nitrogen, uh, alpha carbon, carboxyl carbon, 
following nitrogen. So here you got this nitrogen and there's all sorts of things that could clash. It's just, you're just bringing it in to where it's making it, things very crowded and, um, and it's, it's going to clash with something. Like if maybe it won't clash with this oxygen, maybe that moves out of the way, but it's just, it's just making things crowded and making, making uh, things a bit difficult. So, so those are those are two uh, two of the sorts of clashes that you might see. Uh, there are a couple of others, uh, but that gives you an idea. So, so basically, Ramachandran uh, built this this plot or constructed this plot by doing precisely this, just basically looking at uh, steric clashes. And uh, the, the the empirically uh, um, collected uh, phi and psi histograms. Look surprisingly similar to that. They're not exactly like this, but they're but they're they're actually quite similar, uh, which is which is a, a bit uh, perhaps a bit surprising considering how how this sort of simple-minded manner in which this was this was uh, obtained. Okay, so so I'm not sure how much emphasis I put on this, but there is a peptide bond here between the N and the carboxyl carbon. And so that that a consequence of that is that this is this is going to be planar. So so if there's a if there's an N, and there's a carboxyl carbon like this, the the hydrogen is always going to be in trans with this oxygen, the carboxyl oxygen, and then the sort of uh, next alpha carbon is always going to be in trans with the preceding alpha carbon. And so, 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 but, but right now I want to focus on this fact that this O is always in trans with this H, and that means that <clears throat> that that there's there are going to be a lot of hydrogen bonds that are formed between this O and this H. Um, I mean, not not necessarily across the peptide bond. In fact, never across the peptide bond like this, but but in many different uh, configurations, this is going to be possible to do. And one of those is the um, the the alpha helix. So here's here's for example one of these carboxyl oxygens is pointing down, and it's got uh, and then there's there's a there's a the, the succeeding um, nitrogen has its amide hydrogen pointing up, and all if you if you have all the residues doing exactly this, then all the hydrogens are pointing up, all the carboxyl uh, oxygens are pointing down, and you're going to make a, a, a procession of hydrogen bonds that are all going in the same direction, right? So, so um, let's say these these hydrogens have partial plus charge. These oxygens have partial minus charge, having to do with electronegativity. And so, there's going to be an electric dipole that looks like this. Oh, sorry, no, I pointed the arrow in the wrong direction. The electric dipole points towards a plus charge, and um, and so there's another one in the following pair of oxygen, uh, hydrogen bond donor and acceptor, and, and so on. The first consequence is that, that, is that, you, that it, you can see that it's possible to make this helical structure, um, which should be stable because it can make all of these hydrogen bonds. So it can satisfy every single one of its carboxyl oxygens and uh, amide hydrogens and have them all in, engaged in, in an identical uh, sort of hydrogen bond, and this is always going to be, or, or sorry, the, in this structure that I'm showing you here, it's going to be between the the n and the n plus four residue, right? So let's say let's label these. So, so let's say this is residue one, this is two, three, four, and five. So you can see that uh, let's see, residue one has this carboxyl oxygen. And then it's interacting with two, three, four, five. Number five. They meet hydrogen of residue number five. So that's I one plus four is, is five, right? So, so that's an I and I plus four interaction. Um and that's repeated. And so 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 since all these dipoles are pointing the same direction, uh you can say that that alpha helices have a net dipole, right? They're all going to add up constructively and make a, a a net dipole for the whole 
Felix. And that's going to have, 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 phys uh, have uh, biophysical consequences. Um, one other thing you might notice is that all of these side chains, are they pointing random directions or they have, do they have a preferred direction? Well, they all seem to be pointing kind of up, at least sort of towards this end of, of, the, of this helix, sort of towards the end terminus. Why is that? Well, this, this has to do with, again, with the planarity of the peptide bond and with the chirality about the alpha carbon. So, so we said that this, this peptide bond is partially hybrid, and that means that um, it, oxygen is always in trans with this uh, be not, uh, hydrogen. And, um, and so, so if you already know where all these amide nitrogens or the carboxyl carbons and, and nitrogens are, 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 are positioned, then that doesn't leave much in terms of freedom for this alpha carbon, right? It's going to be sitting between these two. And then due to chirality, we know that, the, that well, there, there are two valence orbitals that can be satisfied. And we know that hydrogen is going to take this one that's sort of pointing down, and our side chain is going to take this other one that's pointing sort of in the more, of, more in the up direction. Uh, and so, so there's, there's just basically no escaping that pattern. All the side chains are going to be pointing in that preferred direction. The last thing to note is that the, these are, this is semi-useful number. I don't think you should necessarily memorize it, but 3.6 residues per turn. So somewhere between three and four res, kind of, kind of intermediate between three and four residues per turn. And that, that means that, um, that just as there is a hydrogen bond between I and I plus four, there are some other contacts that, that are quite uh, feasible between I and I plus three. Uh, and so, 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 so these side chains, uh, these side chains can interact, can also interact in patterns of I and I plus four and patterns of I and I plus three, right? So there's one side chain of, of one could interact with maybe with side chain four and five. Uh, and you'll see that, that this results uh, in a bioinformatical pattern that can also be detected. You know, for instance, let's say, let's say one side of, of this helix is going to be exposed to solvent. So these are all water molecules like this. Uh, and then this side is buried somehow in protein. Um, you're going to start to see some, some, some patterns, right? You're going to, you're going to see, uh, for instance, that, that, that the ones on this side are all going to be, um, uh, hydrophilic or tend to be hydrophilic residues or polar residues. And the ones on the left side are going to be uh, nonpolar hydrophobic residues. Uh, okay, but, but these, these are things we'll get into when we talk about uh, secondary structure prediction. I'm just sort of preparing the ground for that. Now, beta sheets. So, so beta sheets um, also sort of arise from uh, these these patterns in, 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 in the peptide. Uh, so, so let's say we have a, a, a nitrogen, which has a meat hydrogen, and you have the alpha carbon, then you have carboxyl carbon, and then you have another nitrogen, and uh, this was partial hybrid. And you have alpha carbon, and you have carboxyl carbon. These guys, um, I mean, let, let's let's say they're just, there's just the, the the backbone just does this sort of zigzag like this. So so the side chain, remember from the corn rule, core. Mm -hmm. So let's say if the hydrogen is coming out of the page at you like this, then the the side chain. It's going to go sort of into the page like that. And it turns out that the next carbon is in exactly the same situation, except it's gone through two, through three flips, one, two, three, more or less kind of roughly, very, very roughly 180 degrees. And so that means you can expect it to, to be kind of like, like it's just flipped over. And so whatever's true for this, the opposite is going to be true for this in terms of the direction of the side chain. And um, and so so that means that the that this here the side chain is going to be coming out of the page, and oh sorry, 
Yes, I drew that correctly. And then the hydrogen is going to be sort of into the page. And so I haven't even gotten to the good part yet, right? So, so the good part is, or the interesting part is that what, what starts to happen if you put another structure like this right next to it. So, so I'm just going to get ahead of myself. This is a beta sheet, right? That's, that's what a single beta sheet looks like. You put another one next to it, like this, alpha carbon, this hydrogen out of the page, and this uh, side chain into the page. Then there's a carboxyl oxygen. First of all, what can this carboxyl oxygen do? Well, it's a hydrogen bond acceptor, right? And we know this 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 nitrogen has a hydrogen the, the, the hydrogen bond. Anyway, the the next one is going to be uh, nitrogen, and then uh, C alpha, and this one has a side chain coming out of the page, right? Because the one before had going into the page, right? So out of the page, side chain. Uh, and into the page hydrogen. And then lastly, there's a, there's a carboxyl over here. And um, so, so what do you notice about these R's? Right, for we already, we already said that along the strand they're, they're alternating. One's going into the page, one's going out of the page, one's going into the page, one's coming out of the page. And since they're both these strands are following the same pattern, then the ones that are into the page are sort of aligned across strands, right? So, so, so into the page and into the page, they're next to each other. So, so the side chains across strands are in contact or they're both going the same direction with respect to the beta sheet. So, so the next alpha carbon, these side chains you see are both coming out of the page. And so they'll be, they'll be interacting, but on the near side of the beta sheet. Uh, and we mentioned that, that, um, that these, that these um, uh, carboxyl oxygens and amide hydrogens are all gonna be aligned such that they can make a nice hydrogen bond, right? So, so, you know, there's going to be a, just like this one, I had an opportunity to make a hydrogen bond. Every, every single one will have exactly the same opportunity. I just have to draw a few more. Uh, I mean, th this hydro, this, these carboxyls are pointing down, so they'll have to have a, that opportunity with something that's below them, right? So it could be, um, for example, this one. So this, this is actually um, a little bit, Awkward. They're not. They're not ideally situated. Like this one has to stretch a little bit this way to make this hydrogen bond, and this this one has to stretch a little bit in the opposite direction. So they're a little bit strained, and that's because these guys are going the same direction. And to see is pointing that way. So these are parallel. There's also anti-parallel, and in the case of anti-parallel, where one's going in this direction, the other one's going in the other direction then these hydrogen bonds are going to be a lot more comfortable. And so anti-parallel, uh, anti-parallel is a lot happier energetically. I mean, I don't know if I should say a lot, it's all relative, but, but it, it, it's happier energetically and um, you're actually going to see them occurring much more often than the parallel uh, configuration. So that's beta sheets. And, or those are beta sheets. And, um, sorry, I need to get power. Okay. And next I wanna talk about coil coils. Uh, so, sorry, I forgot to mention, that we, we talked about beta sheets and we talked about, I'm oh, sorry, alpha helices. We talked about beta sheets. Uh, the third major type of secondary structure you need to think about is random coils. And that just means anything that's not in secondary structure. And those tend to, those have a, a bit more tendency to be on the surface of proteins where they, they can move around and interact with water. They, they tend to be harder to, to observe crystallographically because they are so mobile. Um, and so, so, you know, in general, just, just a sort of a random connecting element 
between pieces of secondary structure. But, uh, but this slide is, is more about coiled coils. And so coiled coil is what happens when you get not one alpha helix, but rather two alpha helices. And they start kind of twisting around each other like this. Uh, and this can go on for, for a long time. Like these can be quite long. And um, there's a, a pattern here. Since, the, since here at this interface, uh, the, the, these side chains are in contact with the side chains of the other alpha helix. They are buried, and so they will be hydrophobic. So you, you can expect them to be hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. And then on the, on the outside, something like this. Um, here you can expect them to be uh, more polar. Uh, in fact, there's, there are even a couple positions where you can expect them to be charged because they need to make interactions across the strands to, to hold them together. So we're going to get into that uh, again in, when we do prediction of secondary structure. But I just want you to know the definition of coiled coils. Okay, and then lastly, the protein data bank, or that, this is the last slide, but this is the last kind of topic, is, is um, the protein data bank is a primary database. Uh, it is the primary repository of structural data. So if you, if you experimentally obtain a, 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 um, a protein structure, you're expected to, to deposit it in the PDB for publication. Journals will, will, will most often require you to do that. Uh, and um, so the PDB um, has a, a growing number of structures. Uh, I, I argued earlier, oh, actually at some point you'll see a, uh, a plot showing how, how, how fast this is growing, but it's, it's basically quadratic growth more or less. Uh, in number of structures because because the the uh, the number of structures that are being resolved uh, uh, every year is increasing linearly, right? So the integral of a linear function is a quadratic function. But there's a, there's also quite a bit of redundancy, and the reason for this, as uh, as you also hear later in this course, is that um, that the era of new fold discovery is over. There are no new folds being discovered. Um, and to, to a growing extent, people, experimentalists, are solving the same structures over and over again with, with somewhat different conditions. Um, so, um, so yeah, so those, those are two things to think, keep in mind. Um, and then as, as, as to how we, we are obtaining these structures, there are a couple different ways. There's NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And this, this, uh, this, um, takes advantage of the fact that you that you have uh, a a magnetic dipole in your nuclei um, and that behaves in certain ways when you have an external applied magnetic field and further it can couple um, through another uh, nucleus and affect its its behavior its dynamics in the in the in the face of or in the presence of this of this external applied field. And you can observe the change in the dynamics of, of this nucleus due to this nucleus. Uh, and then that way you can infer this distance between them. Uh, so so it's, it's, a, it's quite a, it's a bit of a noisy method. Uh, so you can't have too many atoms. And so it's a bit limited in size. So, so this is, this is more for small structures. And there, there's quite a bit of uncertainty. It, it works well in solutions, so that some of the uncertainty might be that the, that the atoms are actually moving with respect to each other. But a lot of it is just because um, your, 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 your experimental data is just not certain enough to where you can tie down the, the distance between, between all pairs of atoms. Uh, then there's crystallography. And for a long time, crystallography has been the king of structural resolution methods. And it's kind of, in a nutshell, um, you have an incoming uh, X-ray beam, and it encounters these atoms, and each atom then becomes an emitter of X-rays. It's kind of more or less kind of like dispersing the X-rays, and these these are going to once it hits a screen, these these two 
atoms are going to, or the, or the waves emitted from these two atoms are going to have some sort of interference pattern, which tells you something about the distance between them, right? Uh, and th there's a whole science behind that, which we're not going to get into. Let's do a clean slide for cryo-EM. So the way cryo-EM works is you, you have an electron beam. Just shooting electrons uh, down to some surface upon which you have deposited your molecule of interest. And it's not in a crystal. These molecules are in random or orientations and random positions. Uh, and your beams, your electron beam is going to go through them and it's going to generate some sort of 2D image on your detector below. And these are all going to be in different orientations and they're going to be pretty blobby. They, these, you can barely see any features at all because well, depending on, on what size your sample is, because that they're, they're, the resolution is very, very low at this stage. But um, what has been behind the Crowley-M revolution has been new techniques to then um, orient these, these uh, images so, so that they're all in the same orientation and then add them up, right? So if you, if you detect there's, there's a single group like the, that these two molecules, for instance, are, are in the same, uh, let's say the same, same sort of conformational group, and then you can just rotate one of the two and superimpose on the other. And once you get a sufficient number of these images, stacked up on, on each other, you can just add them. And the, the more images you have, the better they're aligned, the higher resolution you will be, and you will be able to get, uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, atomic resolution. And th this is a technique that's going to work best for large molecules, because there's this, there, because like we said, that the, these images are going to be very, very low resolution initially. And um, if they're too small, and you you won't be able to detect any features on them, and you won't be able to orient them. They're just going to be look like blobs, and you're just going to be add one blob over another blob, and you're going to get nothing. Um, they've been they've been particularly good for things like the ribosome, where where they're big and uh, and uh, and feasible to orient. And these these are also um, uh, molecules that are very hard to to resolve using crystallographic methods, let alone anymore. So the protein data bank uh, has two supported formats. Uh, there's the, the PDB format or protein data bank format and the MMSIF format. And the PDB is one that's been around for longer um, and it has been surprisingly stubborn just because it's so easy to use. The, 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 way, the way it works is, is you have, if you have different records, for example, you can have an atom record and that might have things like the atom number and the atom type, let's say carbon. And then, um, and then things like, like uh, uh, chain IDs and, and the, the you know, X position, the Y position and the Z position. But things like th these are all fixed, fixed column widths, right? And so, so, so there were a few problems. Um, this means that um, that you have limited atom numbers, uh, limited volume, because once you once your x, y, and z get too big, they just they, they just won't fit in this col these columns. Uh, let's see, you have your chain IDs. You have a limited number of chains because you you have one character for your for each chain in, in your complex, and so you're limited by the number of characters in your let's say your character set or your alphabet or whatever you're using. Uh, and so 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 it, it's a very easy to use format again, uh, but it's also very limiting once especially once you start to think about bigger structures. And so that so that that's that's why MMSIF um, has come to the fore. It's, it's MMSIF has also been around for, for, for quite a while, but it's a little bit harder to use. Um, certainly not impossible, but, but um, 
you had to um you you would need to to create these these dictionaries um and these tell you basically what what the data looks like that's following right so so for instance here's here's this dictionary we're saying okay we're gonna uh, declare this thing called atom site group so um Mm, let's see that there's the there's a, an id so i think i think this is just adam right and there's id so that we some sort of number like adam number one two three four then there's the adam type symbol so this is element name and uh like o c things like that uh then uh there are gonna be things like there's gonna be the x position y position z position and so, so th those are the columns that you're seeing down here below, right? So, so here's the one that just said Adam, and here's the one that says the Adam number, and here's the, the uh, what do we call this? The Adam Adam type or type symbol. Then there's the actual Adam label or name, so like O5 prime, or whatever. Then there's the residue name here, the chain ID, and so on. But but the cool thing about this is that um, that it's flexible, right? So you, you could arbitrarily define um, define some new uh, symbol in your dictionary, and then you just add it, uh, and that would be that. If there's some new property that you want to record, and the other thing is is that since it's not a fixed format anymore, in other words, that the columns are not fixed width, they're variable width. That means you can put any number of of, of digits. Let's say here in this column, this is your x position. So here we have um, three digits to the left and, and a whole bunch of digits to the right of the decimal point, but there's no there's no limit to the number of, of of digits to the left of the decimal point, right? So you, so you could have thousands, tens of thousands, millions of Ongstroms, no problem. And you could also have unlimited um, uh, precision to the right of the decimal place uh, decimal point. Mm. And and you, likewise, your chain ID here that these chain chain IDs are a single letter, but there's no reason why they couldn't be multiple letters. You can have an entire sentence in there, uh, probably avoiding things like spaces. But anyway, you, you can have a very long chain ID. Uh, and so, so and, and, and again, it's flexible. So you can, if, if there's some additional property that you want to record some future time, you would have the flexibility to do that, or at least more flexibility. Um, Okay, so that's the MMC format, and 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 for a long time, I my software used the PDB, and um, and then MMC or sorry, the the, the protein data bank decided, and actually the entire community decided that that we're, that we're going to abandon the PDB or we're going to uh, or not abandon it, but deprecate the PDB and move towards MMC, and and then and then luckily I have a collaborator that put a postdoc on it, and and now my code uh, supports MMC also. Uh, and so you pretty much have to you just have to keep up with community standards. Uh, and that is about all I'm going to say about the basics of protein structure.